Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, for me to be part of this panel this afternoon, and particularly for me to be part of the of this uh, grand rounds. Uh, the leadership that Abi and and, and the, the, the the student group here at Massey have shown in putting this together is really outstanding. And as Jeff noted this morning, the timing couldn't be more perfect uh, between a, a, a provincial and a federal uh, uh, budget. Jeff made some very powerful uh, uh, observations this morning, and uh, I think the best summary uh, of those observations uh, was in one of his own phrases, that the poor pay uh, 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 for their uh, poor health, uh, the, the, excuse me, the poor pay uh, for their poverty uh, with uh, their poor health. Um, is really summarizes uh, in, in, in the simplest possible way uh, the, the implications of, of not addressing the societal determinants of health. The other thing that was, that was uh, quite evident to me in his presentation uh, was that uh, with a careful, systematic, uh, equity-oriented approach uh, to culture, to organization, uh, and to uh, health uh, uh, healthcare uh, 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 outcomes, uh, it is in fact possible to redress uh, major uh, inequities uh, in access and in outcomes. Um, other speakers uh, this morning um, or this afternoon emphasized that in terms of, um, for example, um, uh, equi uh, equitable outcomes as they pertain to cancer and cancer care, uh, issues like income, age, sex, and distance, uh, um, or your, your physical approximate relationship to uh, point of care uh, uh, delivery services, actually do make a very, very significant difference in terms of incidence. Uh, and in terms, of, um, uh, in terms of the quality of care that a person uh, or that uh, aggregate groups um, and particularly uh, marginalized aggregate groups are able to actually achieve. Um, we also heard uh, a very telling and powerful presentation on uh, some of the economic issues uh, that surround our healthcare system. Uh, but I think most powerfully, um, uh, Jeremiah emphasized uh, that in fact the issues aren't necessarily economic. It's not simply a matter of money. It's actually about the culture, the organization, and the approach that we take to looking at our healthcare system. So in the broadest possible terms, those are three uh, 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 summative statements around uh, the, the presentations uh, that uh, we saw this morning. And there's obviously a great deal of overlap uh, in terms of those summative uh, 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 conclusions. This afternoon, we have a very, very substantial period of time uh, where we can actually look forward and look at how can we uh, redress uh, uh, inequities in access and inequities in outcomes in our current uh, healthcare system. And we have three uh, outstanding uh, panelists, uh, and uh, it's very much uh, my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce them to you. And I'm going to give you a brief bio of each uh, as we, as I, I now uh, at the beginning of the of the panel, and then I'm going to ask each uh, to speak for approximately 10 minutes, uh, 10 to 15 minutes uh, for uh, Rick's case. In Rick's case, he's a little <laughs> more long-winded than uh, than others, <laughs> which brings me to a bio on Rick. Rick is 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 a is a a great colleague of mine and a and a great friend of mine um, through uh, our mutual affiliation at uh, St. Mike's Hospital. And Rick is uh, uh, probably, I think I can say this without uh, any shadow of overstatement, Rick is, is one of Canada's, if not Canada's most um, distinguished uh, family physician uh, and researcher. Um, he's a senior scientist at uh, the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. He's a scientist at the Keenan Research uh, Center of Li Kai-Sheng Knowledge Institute at St. Mike's. He's a core scientist at the Center for Research on Inner City Health. And he's a practicing family physician, and I might add, not, not simply nominally, like me. Uh, he actually is a very, very competent and highly sought after family physician because of his skills uh, at St. Mike's. And he's also a professor and research chair uh, in the Department of Family and Community Medicine uh, here at the University of Toronto. He's cross-appointed to a number of different departments, including public health sciences, health policy, uh, the Institute of Medical Science, and, and sociology. And as I noted uh, just a moment ago, uh, he uh, was recognized um, by the College of Family Physicians of Canada in uh, 2005 uh, as the Family Medicine Researcher of the Year. And he's one of, I think he's actually the most published 
uh, of uh, family physician uh, researchers uh, in the country. At this point, his main interests uh, focus on primary health care service delivery, um, and which includes for him an examination of primary uh, uh, care reform models, uh, which I hope he'll touch on uh, in his uh, brief uh, remarks. He's also interested in healthcare delivery for disadvantaged uh, urban populations, and he's also focused on population-based and geographic methods uh, for improving uh, equity in health. Um, Michael Bliss, to my left, uh, is also uh, a significant uh, uh, whatever. I don't know how you say it. What do you say about <laughs> Michael Bliss? He's a man of yeah, he's well. He's 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 a man of, of real stature in our country, uh, and uh, he's one of Canada's most distinguished uh, uh, historians. Um, he has uh, produced uh, over the course of his career uh, many many significant uh, books uh, in three uh, different subfields: uh, histories of business, history of medicine, uh, and history of politics uh, in our country. And he's hailed um, as uh, one of Canada's leading. Uh, uh, intellectuals, both within the academy and also within the public domain, and he's very frequently approached um, for his opinion uh, on political, cultural, historical issues um, by news media uh, uh, across the country. Professor Bliss um, is a member uh, of the Order of Canada um, as of 1998, and he's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Uh, and his books have won countless prizes and awards. I won't uh, detail them all for you. Um, but he is, uh, again, uh, one of Canada's most distinguished uh, academics and, and public intellectuals. And his most recent work um, is titled Writing History, A Professor's Life, and it's uh, his memoir. And Michael, I should also mention, is, is one of uh, Massey College's most distinguished and most active uh, fellows. And it's a great pleasure, Michael, that you've, you've agreed to join us today. And Jeremiah, uh, to my right, we've already had a a brief uh, introduction uh, to Jeremiah, and we've already heard uh, his, uh, some of his perspectives, and he's given us a lot to think about. But I'll just remind you uh, that he's a professor and chair of uh, the Department of Economics at Mac, uh, McMaster University, where I went to medical school, so I have some um, warmth to <laughs> kind of offer you there uh, from that perspective. He's also an associate uh, member of the Department of Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics. Um, and a member of uh, the Center for Health Economics and Policy Analysis, uh, or CHAPA, at uh, McMaster. And uh, he's, uh, uh, like uh, uh, all uh, here uh, today uh, on this panel, he's published in, in some of the world's leading um, uh, health economic uh, journals and health services journals, and uh, he's acted as a consultant um, to regional, provincial, national, and international agencies on health economics. And he's currently a member of the Canadian Institute for uh, Health Information's uh, National Health Expenditures Database uh, Expert Group. And his current work uh, includes uh, an examination of uh, public and private roles uh, in healthcare, um, in healthcare financing particularly. Uh, current focus is also uh, on uh, resource allocation and healthcare funding models and the use of incentives uh, in healthcare. And finally, on the application of experimental uh, methods uh, in health economics. So with three very distinguished panelists, um, it's very much my pleasure to, to uh, ask each to speak for a few minutes. Uh, and then uh, I'm hoping that uh, we will have uh, ample opportunity for a good discussion and debate and for, the, um, uh, uh, for, the, for a set of conclusions which we will very happily present to Prime Minister Harper and to each of the premiers, and <laughs> which will be a map uh, for the way forward. So on that, Rick, over to you. So I'm actually not going to talk about primary care models. In our pre-meeting, we decided that it would take 20, 30 minutes just to explain what figs, fins, fits, foes, the whole alphabet soup is. So I am going to talk about my research into neighborhoods, though, which is going to take us upstream into access to some very interesting, I think, and important social determinants of health and access to those kinds of things. And so that's how we get into neighborhoods. But first I'll set, set it up very, very briefly by saying that we know that there's a very complex 
um, ideologic uh, web of, of uh, social disadvantage, early childhood development um, that we've heard about earlier today. And I don't mean to trivialize that in any way, but one of the, because it's extremely complex, but one of the final common pathways is uh, um, most recently being identified, and I'd say this is Cancer Care Ontario and other cancer control groups that have led this, to identify tobacco, alcohol, poor diet and lack of physical activity as some of the final common pathways. These are behavioral pathways that lead to most of the, uh, many of the leading causes of mortality and morbidity and disability in Western societies. And that we've had limited success with individual behavioral level interventions. Not that they're not successful, not that smoking cessation is not successful, not that addressing problem drinking isn't successful or counseling about diet isn't successful, but we still have a lot of those problems with us and some of them are still growing. Societal interventions have been really, uh, if you think about tobacco control, taxation, regulation, uh, putting uh, warning labels, putting, putting uh, packages behind uh, displays and so on, uh, raising taxes, those things have, have had a, a, a larger degree of success. But when we think about these behaviors, these are not just matters of individual choice. And this comes to what, what Jeff re referred to earlier about blaming people, blaming people who are homeless. People are shaped by their environments to an enormous degree. And so when it comes to safe and healthy environments, we maybe think of things like good air quality, low traffic, low crime, low noise. Um, uh, and, but, but, but I'm going to challenge the group a little bit to think about our environment as whether it can encourage or discourage these four huge health habits or health behaviors, let's say, they're not, ha uh, uh, to call them more, more accurately, tobacco, alcohol, promoting good diets and physical activity or inhibiting those things. Can our environment, can where we live, can our neighborhoods uh, have any impact on that? So their local environments, tobacco exposure and, their, and the adverse ex effects of tobacco exposure dramatically decrease with smoking bans. Uh, rates of admission to hospital for heart attack, stroke, uh, chronic obstructive lung disease, pneumonia, asthma, plummet, uh, in, in, plummeted in Ontario municipalities right after the introduction of smoking bans, particularly in restaurants. That seemed to be uh, a prime place where, where, where this was happening. Uh, colleagues of mine have looked at serious assault in its relationship with the volume of local alcohol sales, and there's a very strong relationship between those things. Hospitalized assault and the volume, the daily fluctuation in the volume of local alcohol sales. So what about diet, physical activity, and the very serious consequences down the road of obesity and, and chronic disease such as diabetes? So obesity, as I, I don't need to really tell you, is leading cause of, of uh, heart disease, cancer, arthritis, diabetes, many other things. Uh, simplistically caused by eating too much and not burning off enough calories. Dramatically increasing, now affecting about 25% of adult Canadians. Obesity is a major risk for type 2 diabetes. So there was a 69% increase in diabetes from 1995 to 2005 in Ontario. A large, large variation in this across neighborhoods that I'll show you in just a moment. Non-Caucasian ethno-racial groups are at much higher risk than Caucasian groups are of developing type 2 diabetes, which is the leading kind in adults. And there are very complex interactions with socioeconomic status, gender, and ethnicity. But, those, but, 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 but to what extent, I'm going to ask the question, and I'm going to try to answer it, to what extent are those things modifiable within neighborhoods or within the, 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 uh, uh, the environment? So um, the reason that I, I have uh, so many slides is most of them are maps from here on, and I'll, I'll go through them fairly rapidly. This is one on median house, so, and I apologize for the Toronto-centric nature of what, what I'm going to do. So the northern boundary here is Steeles, eastern boundary is Scarborough, where Scarborough meets Pickering, the western boundary is with Mississauga, and then Lake Ontario to the south. And um, this is a, a map that was popularized by the United Way about a decade ago called Poverty by Postal Code. And you can see that Toronto is a donut, or it's been characterized as a donut. The hole in the middle is uh, Rosedale, Moore Park, Forest Hill, North Toronto, Lawrence Park, very wealthy, very low immigration areas. The low income, high immigration areas surround, the, are, are the donut, that's the hole, that they are the donut, and a few areas on the outside are more advantaged as well. 
Immigrants tend to settle. I don't like the term visible minority. Uh, in Toronto, I'm sure the 2011 census will show that, that it's a visible majority, but uh, this is a term that Statistics Canada uses. This is from the, this is the 2011 census won't be available till 2013 for this particular variable, so I'm using 2006. But you can see this is also the donut, and you've got the hole in the donut with a very low percent of visible minority, and there are places in the donut itself. Uh, sure, that's great. Oh, no. oh, oh, terrific, thank you, terrific. So you can see that there are places up here where 90, up to 94% of the population is uh, non-Caucasian. So here's, here's, the, here's the, the, the map of diabetes in, in, in Toronto, and you can see that this is not a donut. It's got the hole, but it doesn't really join at the bottom so much, and it doesn't join at the top so much, but large parts of Scarborough and large parts of northwestern Toronto descending down towards downtown are, uh, have very high diabetes rates. Uh, these rates incidentally, oops, these rates incidentally, uh, let me just get rid of that somehow without creating more trouble. Uh, those rates reach close to eight or nine percent and in the hole in the donut are two percent. So we have an enormous variation in, in adult uh, diabetes rates in, in, in Toronto. The pattern follows low income and visible minority. So it follows those maps, but, but except for downtown. So what is happening in Toronto's downtown core? Because this is where I focus my research and every, every piece of research I did before this showed low cancer screening, high hospital costs, uh, high rates of smoking. I, I didn't really understand why this was happening. So in order to be diagnosed with diabetes, you have to see a provider and you have to get a diagnosis. We have this phenomena of recent immigrants, particularly in high turnover areas like downtown. Maybe they don't have time to get diagnosed or maybe they're healthy when they arrive because of screening. Is there any possibility that these folks could actually be, that the downtown could be health promoting? And so this was a, a bit of a surprise for us. When we started to look at healthy foods, we got data from the Ontario Food Terminal and from the major chain grocery stores, and we located them all on a map, and we figured out geographic access per 10,000 people to the nearest source of healthy food, which we defined as fruit and vegetables, as produce. And you can see the downtown core has got great access, and many other parts of the city, we calculated up to 40 minutes in each direction by transit or by walking to get to the nearest carrot stick, banana, or tomato, because we think we tracked all of them, except for farmer's markets, we think we tracked it all. Uh, trips walking, uh, 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 walking or bicycling also very heavily concentrated in the downtown core. Tra transit, the same, concentrated in the downtown core. We put this together in an index we called the Activity Friendly Index which it, believe it or not, included density and destinations. It also included crime. Still, the downtown was much more activity friendly, even with all those things figured in, than the rest. And then here's, here's kind of the, the bottom line of what we found. So we find in areas like the northwest of the city and large parts of Scarborough, this is the statistical relationship with a p-value of less than 0.05 of both high diabetes rates and low activity friendliness. And we made it red on purpose. We, we meant this to be um, uh, uh, disadvantageous, undesirable. The blue was used for advantageous uh, areas. These have low diabetes rates and high walkability. And these areas have poor walkability but still low diabetes rates. And you'll see in a moment why they're exceptionally wealthy areas. And so here's the only really complicated thing I'm going to show you. So we have income on the x-axis on a log scale. We have diabetes rates from 2% up to 8% on the y-axis. And you can see the wealthy folks have low diabetes rates. And this is dramatic. These are the low-income neighborhoods up here. These are the high-income neighborhoods. These are the 140 Toronto neighborhoods. The open circles are the lowest walkability, and the dark circles are the highest walkability. That line is the highest walkability, and at every level of income, it's below the, the dotted line above it. These are the four lowest income areas in the city of Toronto. Moss Park, Regent Park, South Parkdale, North, Toronto, North, North St. Jamestown, all downtown, all the lowest income. Diabetes rates around 5%. If you follow this lineup, they should be at least 7 or 8, if not 9 or 10. So they're substantially below where they uh, would be expected to be, as are many of these. Uh, all of these are, are, are quite substantially lower than you would expect. 
So diabetes incidence is higher in low-income recent immigration areas. What we found in further work is that walkability is an independent risk factor. So areas with few resources, few local destinations, poor transit, inability to walk anywhere, healthy food too far to reach, seems to be quite independent of other factors and unfortunately creates this perfect storm. It seems to be additive or perhaps even multiplicative where, for example, diabetes in recent immigrants to Toronto between 2005 and 2010, this is our most recent work. Our previous work was based on diabetes prevalence. This is now based on diabetes incidence. These are people who did not have diabetes when they arrived in Toronto and we followed them for a number of years afterwards. The incidence of diabetes is five, this is per thousand, in high, in, this is all among recent immigrants. Those who ha are lucky enough to live in high income, high walkability areas have a, uh, an, an annual incidence of five per thousand. Those unlucky enough to live in low income, low walkability areas are 16 per, per thousand in terms of their diabetes incidence looking forward over time. So dramatic, dramatic difference. So I would call this, for me, this is what I would call the, the perfect storm. So um, I, I'm going to talk ever so briefly, but this is really the solution space. It's easy for those of us doing health equity research to talk about the problem space. And uh, I know this afternoon is really wanna, we're wanting to focus on the solution space. And some of this is within the health system. Certainly we need to do what we can at the micro level, the individual level, to prevent diabetes, to prevent obesity, to promote healthy lifestyles, to treat people when they have these conditions. But also, we've been doing a lot of work, particularly with Peel region. Peel gets 30,000 new people every year, many from South Asia, which is a very high-risk part of the world. And they've actually been in the process, uh, with help from us and reports that we've done for them, of changing their planning, zoning, bylaws, regulations to allow for more density and to allow for destinations like retail to be mixed with residential. Probably take five to ten years for that to change because these plans are set so far ahead of time. Currently none of that can happen. Private developers were all in favor of this and we looked into it and the provincial reg municipal regulations didn't allow any of it to happen. Uh, we're in the middle of a debate at City Hall that you're very well aware of, of cars versus rapid transit, the war on cars and so on. I can say that uh, Transit City runs through every one of the highest diabetes areas. If it's ever built, it, it will enormously improve people's access to uh, healthy resources. Uh, it's just my, my own personal pitch there. Um, healthy resources like parks, recreation centers, healthy food sources uh, are well supplied in some areas and very, very poorly supplied in others. And again, zoning, regulation, taxation, working with uh, private industry, working with developers can address a lot of these things. And then in Peel region, people actually wanted to walk places and couldn't. There's blowing garbage, uh, six lane roads, uh, barriers between uh, major 400 series highways, no snow cleared, all these kinds of issues were turned out to be enormous. So just to finish up, health friendly neighborhoods uh, would be part of a strategy. So this was what I would see, consider like the meso level, the local neighborhood level. But we need macro level strategies as we've had with tobacco control around taxation, regulation, legislation. We need micro level policies and action around individuals, counseling, education and supports. But, if you, but, but when I, I can talk myself blue in the face to my patients about going for a walk, if they don't have any place to walk to, if it's not safe, uh, they're just not going to. Uh, same with healthy food. If they can't afford it, if it's not available to them, they really can't do it. So um, what I would say in conclusion is that the healthy, health-friendly neighborhoods can influence behaviors. We've seen it away from tobacco and alcohol use, and I, 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 I think to a large degree now, this is part of a very large literature that this is towards healthy diets, active living, reduced obesity, and reduced uh, diabetes. So uh, my team consists of uh, endocrinology, health service researcher, uh, epidemiologists, two, geog two wonderful geographers, sociologists, wonderful biostatistician, and uh, lots more information should you ever want it is available on the web. I'm just, uh, <clears throat> Jeremiah, would you like to give us a few words? You can stay here, you can go to the podium, whatever you prefer. I don't have slides, so. Uh, certainly. Um, uh, a few comments. I mean, this, as Rick said, the theme of this is kind of moving forward, which is always far more challenging than all sorts of fancy analysis of what's wrong uh, with the system. So I, I thought I'd share a few thoughts as I reflected on this problem and how, and how to also get beyond certain kinds of platitudes that we all, every report for the last 25 years has said and so forth. Um, 
as I think about trying to move forward towards building a sustainable, equitable system, effective system for the uh, people who rely upon it, um, an area where I think uh, we need to do a fair bit of work is figuring out how do you affect change when no one is in charge. Uh, because we have a system in which no one is in charge. The ministry is not in charge. Various stakeholders aren't in charge. And whenever people pull out the examples of where people really successfully change systems, some of you have probably heard about the VA system in the U.S. during the 1990s under Ken Kaiser, completely transformed what had been a, a dysfunctional system. Uh, certain aspects of Kaiser Permanente in the States. Certain aspects in China, I was reading these presentations about following the, AV, the flu epidemic, just massive changes. The UK even, much more effective in creating change in the system. It's not always better, but they change it nonetheless. <laughs> um, and the point is these are all command and control. The unitary states, the unitary systems, and someone says we're going to change, and they can tell people to change. Uh, at least the organization and delivery and so on and so forth. Canada, we can't do that. And I think we really need to, I'm hoping political scientists and others can come forward to really help us think more carefully about how do we affect change in a system that is a collaborative system, a decentralized system, and you can't just tell people to change. You've got to somehow uh, uh, create an environment and a culture that encourages change uh, and it towards a more effective system. So that would be the one thing I, I think about, because in fact, I, th I think Canada has lagged behind many, many countries, just in a, purely in our ability to undertake reform at a system level. There's lots of good things happening on the ground at different places in Canada, but the ability to really undertake serious systemic reform, we have been stuck for a number of years. Um, second point, I think we want to, uh, as part of this, I guess, uh, try and establish more accountability, more effective accountability relationships, and I would, and I would say particularly with physicians. Um, uh, they often get picked upon. <laughs> Um, so I don't mean to zero in on them, except they do allocate most of the resources in the system, right? They're the ones who decide who gets in the hospital and who gets the drug and so on and so forth. So we have to focus on them as a, as a, key, uh, a key stakeholder if we're going to affect change. And by greater accountability, I guess, I guess what I mean is both accountability in some formal sense to the, you know, the ministry, to the public, publicly funded system, but also to patients in more broadly the system, in that, of course, historically they have funded fairly autonomously. It's not been right to question doctors and what they do, and they have successfully uh, maintained a fair bit of autonomy. Um, I, I guess what I foresee is a situation, for instance, in which, I mean, the ministry contracts with doctors, right? They're an insurance, the ministry is an insurance organization. They contract to say, you can treat our beneficiaries and we'll pay you for treating our beneficiaries. It has not functioned as a contractual relationship historically. Uh, we negotiate, pay, and other things. I, I would hope we can move over time towards being able to say, well, you know what? If you're going to work in our system, if you're going to treat our patients and we're going to have that relationship, here are some standards of care, standards of your organization, standards of how you deliver services that we, that we expect of anyone who we're going to be contracting with, just as it's typical in any kind of contractual relationship between a purchaser and someone who's providing a service. Accountability goes beyond that, but, but that, that's a, a group that I would particularly focus on, uh, I think, where I think it would be important if we're really going to affect system change. Um, primary care so far has induced doctors to join in these organizations, uh, but really hasn't done a lot to affect in real change in practice patterns, right? They're now in bigger groups. Some of them now hire uh, other providers, other allied health professionals, and so forth. Uh, there are some minimal requirements about after hours care and so forth, but it, it's been quite minimal. Uh, so a focus on accountability is part of that. Uh, people have mentioned this in here again. I, I wish I could say more about how to do this. This is bordering on the platitude side, I have to admit, but um, a stronger culture of evidence and analysis. Uh, historically, across the board in Canada, ministries of, ministries of health have not invested heavily in building units that can undertake the kinds of analysis that's required to plan a system and, and oversee a system. And I compare that with something like Kaiser Permanente in the US, who has a huge division that hires many, many uh, analysts doing work directly contributing to 
uh, how Kaizen makes decisions about the kinds of services they're going to offer, how they're going to organize their practices. The uh, fourth thing, and um, I got his wallet. Okay, <laughs> that's right. There's nothing. There's no money in. It, I can tell you that. Um, uh, and, and this will sound perhaps strange to some of you as an economist. Um, I think we focus too much on financial incentives. I think we focus too much on trying to use incentives to induce the behavior that we want people to undertake. I think we have to pay careful attention to incentives. So it's not that I'm saying incentives don't matter. Incentives matter hugely, financial incentives. What I'm saying is I don't think we should rely upon them as, as the mot main motivator for change and for telling people what we want them to do. Um, we, need to, we need to create systems where people aren't penalized financially for doing the things we want them to do and that can allow change to happen. So yes, more food move from fee-for-service to capitation because I think it allows much more flexible practice arrangements and a whole sort of other things or blended arrangements. But I'm talking about where we say the way we're going to motivate and affect change is by carefully designing financial incentives, whether it be a pay-for-performance system or variations on that theme. There are some places for that, but I would argue they're quite limited. What we really need to do is to work on more organizational, cultural changes in how, and how organizations operate, how practices operate, because that will affect real change, I think, that will be longer lasting. And I do think there's a danger over time when you rely entirely on incentives. It means, therefore, you've got to get them right. Because if, you, if people get used to saying, I'm going to do what they tell me based on what the incentives are, if you don't get them right, you're now, because you've just induced a whole bunch of bad behavior. Uh, so I think, I think incentives, we have to be very careful about the extent to which, again, we use them as explicit motivators. I think there's a broader set of, of a whole set of organizational and, and policy and other kinds of ways to, to try and affect change that we desire. And my last point, uh, we'll come back around to some financing. And as I said, I don't actually think financing is, the, the, our system of financing is the fundamental problem that we have to address. Uh, there are lots of questions about the level and so on and so forth, but you know, basically a primarily single-payer publicly financed system uh, has a lot to say for it. Um, there, there are a couple of things about around that major comment, though. One is, of course, there are areas where we are woefully inadequate in terms of access. Again, we all know they're the dental, the, uh, the um, drugs, the uh, various allied health professionals, sometimes physiotherapy, psychotherapy, and so on and so forth. I think we need to be creative about how we can create better access to what are medically necessary services that currently are not funded by our system. And part of that is thinking, here I think we need to be open about the political reality of certain changes that we can make. Uh, unfortunately, we, we, we live in a, we have a system, healthcare is constantly expanding because we constantly can do more things for people. We live in a political culture in which you cannot raise, say, the T word, right? You can't raise taxes under any circumstances. Well, it's kind of tough. You've, you've capped income, but you, we have a system that's naturally expanding for a bunch of reasons, some good, some bad. So I do think we need to think about creative approaches, in particular ways that somehow allow you, perhaps you to link increased payments into the system to better services, better access, and so on and so forth. And the, and the key is, of course, we know we can do that one way. We just go for private financing, right? It will expand. The problem, of course, is this will lead to all kinds of, of uh, trouble with equity, right? So it's how, how can we do this in a way, create and think about fin financing instruments that can maintain our equity focus, but give a bit more flexibility in how we think about raising money through our collective system? And I, I think a lot of careful thought has to go into that over the next number of years. So I'll stop there. <clears throat> Thank you, Jerry. Michael, over to you. Well, that was perfect because I, I'm going to answer your question. 
but I, I, I have a peculiar method. I look forward by looking backwards. I try to see where we've been and the lessons we've learned from yesterday and the day before, and many years before that. And in particular, a year or two ago, the C.D. Howe Institute uh, asked me to give a, a special lecture on uh, the lessons we've learned about our healthcare system because it's now been almost 45 years since Universal Medicare was introduced in Canada. We have a lot of history with healthcare and trying to change it, trying to make it. We, we've learned some things that work and we've learned many things that, that don't. Um, and I'm going to play on what we've learned and particularly the tension we have between uh, the notion of equality and universality. Um, it's striking how committed we are in Canada to equality of access to health care. That was what the introduction of Medicare was about in the 1960s. It, it was an attempt to strip away the problem of paying for health care so that people wouldn't be financially hindered, so they would have equality of access. All of our experience since then is that Canadians deeply value equality of access to health care. Um, almost all attempts to change the system in ways that would violate our commitment to equality have failed. Uh, private health care is suspect in Canada because it's felt that it's a way in which the rich can use their money to jump the queue, and we won't allow that. All attempts, and there have been a lot of experiments at the provincial level, to try to suppress uh, demand for the system by instituting user fees or co-payments have failed because it has been seen again as a way of victimizing the sick, allowing the rich to, to get a freer ride. Uh, we're not going to give up equality of access to health care in Canada. We do know that costs have to be contained. And what's significant is that we now have 40 years of experience in trying to contain health care costs. Um, the first, the, Medicare came in about 1968. By 1971, people were saying the system is unsustainable and we have to reform it. And governments in the 1970s were talking about all the things that we so often hear today. We've got to switch from, um, uh, switch to preventive medicine. We've got to uh, bring in nurse practitioners, other people. And we've had this litany of uh, attempts to um, reform the system to make it more efficient ever since. For the most part, it hasn't worked. Uh, and the story of modern healthcare, not only in Canada, but in all advanced countries, is that healthcare expenses have a tendency to rise <laughs> very fast and keep on rising. No country has been able to rein them in in the long run. There are lots of reasons for this. I think the most important is that our people want health care. Health care really is a social good. As Dr. Turnbull said, it's not a drain on the economy. In fact, one of the best things you do as you become a rich country is you look after the health and welfare of your people. That's what John Kenneth Galbraith talked about in the affluent society, the kind of social spending that we should be doing. There is an enormous demand for health care, and I don't think it can be suppressed. I think our experiments at suppressing it have, for the most part, not worked. Now, Dr. Hurley showed that beautiful graph in which he showed that in the 90s, we did sort of manage to bring costs under control. And that's true. The 90s were the decade when, uh, I guess they were the, the golden age of at least one school of health economists in Canada, the people who felt that you could control costs by uh, reducing, uh, by, by attacking the supply side of the equation. If you reduce the numbers of physicians, you would reduce the amount of billing. Um, if you, uh, if you uh, uh, didn't bring in new uh, diagnostic machines, you wouldn't have to pay for new diagnostic machines. Uh, and if you had if you could keep on enforcing the Canada Health Act, you, were, you had a monopoly so that you could stop 
the growth of a private sector and therefore under the monopoly you could begin to squeeze the system and you could get real results. The problem is that the system of the 90s was unsustainable. By the end of the 1990s an enormous backlash had built up against the starving of our healthcare system. Uh, we were seeing, uh, and Paul showed, that the public was losing confidence in Canadian healthcare. People were getting really mad that they couldn't find doctors. They were getting really mad that they had to wait in lineups. They were getting even madder when they found that, as happens in a rationing system, people find ways of getting around the lineups, especially politicians. Um, by the end of the 1990s, public confidence in the system was being lost. Uh, the private sector was growing, sometimes surreptitiously. Black markets were beginning to develop. Um, and in fact, what had to happen is governments had to reconsider, back off, and we have had now had a decade in which, for the most part, uh, we've had the backlash and a lot of money has been poured back into the system to try to keep the Canadian people happy. I don't think there are going to be any magic answers, but I think that the, we should rethink the meaning of equality and universality. The debate in the 1960s about health care was, if you're going to um, give everybody access, if you're going to pay, if you're going to give everybody equal access to health care, does that mean that you had to give everybody equal health care benefits? Some people said, why not just pay for the health care costs of the poor? Let the rich look after themselves. Uh, in fact, that makes a lot of sense. The problem was, and this was a problem that had developed in other areas of social policy, how do you determine who's rich? How do you determine who's poor? The governments, as they became more socially active, were bedeviled by the problem of means testing. And many people said you just can't do it, you can't, you can't force people to sort of get down on their knees and beg for benefits, you'd better give social benefits to everybody. And so in the development of the early welfare state, our first old age pensions in Canada were universal old age pensions, everybody got the same pension. Our child welfare policies were universal policies, everybody got the same baby bonuses, and our health care was universal. Everybody got the same health care benefits, all of the necessary medical and hospital benefits they needed. Um, over time, governments under financial pressure found that it was possible, there were a lot of mechanisms uh, to switch from universality to, in effect, means-tested social programs. You, we did it we, with the baby bonuses. We gradu you use the tax system basically to do it. With the baby bonuses, we abandon the universal family allowance and we put it on a needs basis. With old age pensions, we uh, effectively abandon the universal old age pension and assistance to the aged is now put on a needs basis. I suggest to you that the most likely financial reform and this is the answer to your question, I think, is that we're going to have to move away from giving benefits to everybody in the country, including all of those people who don't need them, and targeting our benefits on only those people who do need them. Uh, I think this is a crucial financial uh, fiscal re uh, reform that needs to be done so that we can keep the system going. Uh, yesterday, the Ontario government did a number of things in health care. It capped doctors' incomes. That's going to be politically contentious and probably will backfire. If they can make it work for two or three years, uh, when the, the austerity ends, there will be the catch-up increase and we'll be back where we were. They postponed uh, hospital expansion. That's surely going to be contentious, especially in Mr. Hudak's writing, um, because were these proposals for hospital expansion not really necessary for the health of Ontario? Were they just frivolous and we don't need them? Uh, or are we biting into something? But one thing they slipped in yesterday is the Ontario drug benefit. 
for seniors, which will now have a new deductible. The deductible will be doubled for people over a combined income of $160,000. And that, I suggest to you, is the wave of the future and where we're going to go in the financing of health care. Uh, we're going to put uh, things like drug plans on increasingly on a means basis and my guess is that governments are going to extend it and Dr. Hurley's nodding. I hope he mean, he, he's agreeing with me but he, he might not. I tend to be suspicious of some of the broader questions of equality of outcome that have been discussed today. I think it's very hard to get equality of outcome in health uh, and welfare because it seems to me the ideal of social equality involves enormous experiments in social engineering, some of which people here have been involved in and I as a historian have my doubts, serious doubts. But I would say that if you want to do that, if you want to uh, pour money into what you think of as other social determinants of health, it's all the more important that we forget about our false concept of universality. The rich can look after themselves. We don't need to be giving subsidies to bank presidents, maybe not even to highly pensioned university professors. Uh, if the aim of social policy is to help those in need, then money should go to people in need, not to people who aren't in need. Thank you. Uh, I've got lots to say, but I won't say more. <laughs> so, I'll just open the floor. Comments, questions, reflections? I'll, I'll pass the mic around to see if there's that question. Just raise your hand if you have a, a question or a comment for the panelists. Please, go ahead. Um, I just have some uh, questions and thoughts on uh, both ends of the equation in the sense of the prevention end, which is what Rick was talking about, um, you know, the, the uh, confluence of risk factors that seem to have a higher uh, prevalence amongst people in, in low income or new immigrant areas um, that lead to chronic diseases. I um, heard a fascinating um, thing about Quebec um, in which there is a, a policy that every new law has to be reviewed through the lens of the health implication of that law. Uh, so I'm thinking about you saying nobody's in charge. Um, so uh, I'm, it, 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 it sounds absolutely uh, stupendous because um, you know this, the, if, there's, if there's a law about traffic, if there's a law about building, if there, every one of them has to be assessed and viewed from the eyes through the lens of the health implications of it. Um, the downside is that the report about the health implications has no teeth and doesn't actually have to be paid any attention to. But I'm really interested in knowing the thoughts of those around the table about whether that is a mechanism on a policy level uh, that we can address some of these inequalities. Rick, do you want to take that on? Um, there, there has been a lot of talk in the Ontario government about health in all. And I think that's the same concept. The same idea is that when the Ministry of Transportation is making a new policy or passing regulations or new legislation, housing, um, uh, education, uh, all of those areas that they need to attend to health. But I haven't seen it sort of implemented even as far as what you've described in Quebec, let alone have, have a big impact. So maybe it happens at, around the cabinet table. Like I don't know where it happens, but I've heard that principle called Health in All. I've heard it articulated in Ontario numerous times, I do, and it makes tremendous sense. I just don't know where, if and how and where it, it might be happening or maybe it's not happening. But I have heard it articulated. I think <clears throat> it's a wonderful idea. Michael, do you want to address it? All politicians are certainly in favor of it. Um, but it's sort of like environmental review. We'll build environmental review into everything you do, and then governments will find ways of bypassing environmental review or turning it into uh, just a charade. 
So it's just not easy. I was thinking of um, more direct attempts to use legislation to influence behavior and the whole question of social engineering. Um, we're coming off this interesting 40 years experiment we've had trying to get people to stop smoking. And we've had probably pretty good results with it, using all sorts of ways of doing it, including the force of law. Um, but listening to Dr. Glazier, I have a feeling that the battle against obesity is going to be much harder, much, much harder. And there, the notion, you know, the no, I don't like the notion of people in charge. I believe in a diverse democratic society. And in fact, change wells up from below, not from above. And I think that the attempts by people to manipulate populations to change their lifestyle are going to be extremely difficult, extremely difficult. And um, good luck, but... Um, <laughs> so let me ask you a question, Michael, on that. Yeah. What's, where's the limit of that view for you? I mean, for example, if, you look at, if we look at immunization strategies, um, around, I don't know, polio, obviously a, a, an epidemic that had vast yeah. classroom yeah. complications uh, uh, in North America. Um, and polio, um, access to polio uh, vaccine um, has obviously had massive yes. positive public health benefits. And would you see that as social engineering? I mean, what, how do you... Uh, that's what, that, of course, posed the question beautifully, Jim, and has continued to because, of course, vaccination, the demand for compulsory vaccination, created backlashes, and the word conscientious, the phrase conscientious objector comes from the debate about smallpox vaccination. And obviously, as with so much else, the problem is to get the balance right and to, to, um, to work uh, consistent with public consent. Mm -hmm. uh, you can only go so far in trying to compel people. The smoking people have been wrestling with this, of course, all the time. The vaccination people have wrestled with it. My sense is that the anti-obesity people in their enthusiasms are in danger of um, undermining public interest when they talk about fat taxes and banning potato chips and uh, taking away teenagers' French fries. And, and so you're, you're, you're just pushing it much too hard. I, I, I do need to respond. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, they, this is a, these are really important issues. The, um, the, there was a, Atlanta, Georgia is one of the least walkable cities in the world. And they uh, did a, a massive survey of the population asking what kind of area they would like to live in. And they described a beautiful suburb with trees, single family dwellings, two or three car garages, backyards. And then they described a compact urban environment with uh, high rises, townhouses, some detached homes, really great transit, schools kids could walk to. The, uh, you heard about the popsicle test? You live in a walkable neighborhood if your child can go to the store to buy a popsicle and come back by themselves at around age eight or nine or so. If, if it's safe enough to do that, you live in a very walkable neighborhood. So they, they describe these two neighborhoods and because and, and the, the, the argument is that nobody wants to live in those, in those kind of urbanized environments. Uh, and so this would be social engineering to force people build what they don't want. Well, a third of people in Atlanta loved their suburban uh, areas that they lived in. They just, they would not move, they would not trade it for anything. Another third were just befuddled by the question. They just couldn't figure out, it was just too hypothetical. But fully a third were dying to move to the urbanized, walkable, walk to the theater, walk to the bank, walk your kids to school, walk to work, take transit to somewhere. A, a third of the population of Atlanta that is so unwalkable was absolutely enthusiastic about living in areas like that. But as I say, it's not that, we've socially that we'd have to socially engineer it, we would just have to remove current bylaws and regulations that prohibit the building of those kinds of, of areas. Also, you, you know, you, this is an area for big debate. Certain places in California have limited uh, um, the ability for fast food chains to set up in particular areas where there all, are already so many fast food chains. The region of Peel, we did something called the Retail Food Index, the RFEI, Retail Food Environment Index. 
which measures un the number of unhealthy food outlets to, uh, to healthy, five to one. Five to one, unhealthy to healthy within a 10 minute walk, 15 minute walk of people's homes. Five to one. And so the legislation in places like California actually does work. It has worked. It makes a difference. There is a strong correlation between how much unhealthy food there is around you and what you eat. We subsidize cheap calories enormously through the US Farm Bill, which depresses the price of corn worldwide. We have high fructose corn syrup. We have corn chips. It's not there's no public policy here. We are inadvertently or advertently, through certain kinds of subsidies and regulations, creating the world's most unhealthy environments. And I would call that social engineering. Do you want to reply? Well, uh, the Californians <coughs> are, are, in fact, stumbling front into more and more control and greater and greater loss of public confidence because, of course, the logic of what Mr. Glazier says is that somebody who is in charge, that is, the uh, king of the Ministry of Health, is going to legislate the ratio of healthy fast food outlets to non-healthy fast food outlets, and that is serious social engineering. Uh, they, they, there is an argument, of course, that what in fact is happening in this film, there, there's a causality problem. You say, well, it's the lack of access to good foods that causes the, uh, the unhealthy eating. It's also possible that you've got cause and effect confused. It's because you've got people who are not interested in healthy eating that you, get, you don't get the proper healthy outlets. And so you've got a cir circular problem of how you change behavior. Go ahead. It's also lack of transportation. They're all they're busy trying to go to work. It's also lack of transportation. They're busy trying to go to work, and uh, so you need to get grab something really fast. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the transportation, you're, you're or a long commute. You're gonna you you want the fast food. Bobby, um, I'd like to uh, focus a little on the role of the uh, consumer or the citizen, uh, and make a point about the issue of medically necessary care as being a defining um, a, a target of uh, acceptable care. Um, in my practice, invariably, uh, my patients are on uh, alternative medicines, nutraceuticals, materials that come from very strange places. And it's invariant because I deal with a population with chronic disease, obesity, heart disease, diabetes, and the rest. But it's terribly commonplace. And they invest a huge amount of money in those investments and have no idea about their effectiveness. And so we have in society the notion that the individual, being an individual, should have the freedom to choose as they like, but spend varying amounts based on no uh, evidence. But cocktail conversation and uh, 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 friendly suggestions. To what extent is the individual responsible for their own care? And to what extent is health care expenditure determined by that kind of unbridled assumption of utility of alternative medicines and alternative uh, devices? Do you want to try that, uh, uh, Jeremiah? Sure, I mean, I think as an economist, <laughs> I mean, I think there's a couple of a couple of things there. One is, I mean, there's a whole area of regulation of alternative medicines and so forth, which sorry, you know, they 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 have been historically underregulated. Some of them can be have quite powerful effects on people, and so I think we're trying to do catch up in that whole area, and also trying to put in more guidelines and what kind of evidence has to be available before they can make certain claims and that and, and, and that's but that's looking at from the point of view of the ensuring safety and the, the standard kind of safety arguments as to why uh, consumers um, uh, there should be some kind of regulation I mean the question of so then your point they're buying they're spending money on things that are useless well we spend money on all kinds of things that are useless right it's called they're called consumer goods and to the extent that we say this is a consumer good, even though it has something we, we think of it somehow related to health, it's a consumer good. It's outside the bounds of what we see as medically necessary and therefore should, subject to the <coughs> regulations that we have for the core system. 
Um, uh, no different than parts of cosmetic surgery and so on and so forth where you ensure quality, but it's up to you if you want to get rid of your wrinkles this particular way. Um, I mean, you're leading in the end towards more broadly ideas of medical necessity and impact on expenditure and so on and so forth, consumer-driven needs. I mean, of course, there's, there's a demand side. I mean, I, I would say that I think we too often do immediately revert to it's a, it's a system problem, it's a supply side problem. There are, in fact, demand, I'm going to call it demand side problems, consumers wanting things, so on and so forth. I don't think it's nearly as big as some claim. You know, what, once you're in the doctor's office, once you're in the hospital, you're not making most of those decisions yourself. That's a system, right? But there are, in fact, uh, demand side issues. I think the whole issue of medical necessity, and we need to define that, and we need to decide what's medically necessary and what's not, is a red herring. We will never do that. It will be completely wasted effort to try and define it completely wasted effort to think that we're going to decide what service is or is not because very few services are universally medically necessary or not. It's medically necessary in some circumstances but not others and our problem is the number of things that are used in situations in which they're not appropriately used. So uh, that whole part of debate which we go through periodically is a red herring in terms of trying to control system costs. If we can just define what's medically necessary, we will solve the problem and it's just, it, it's a non-starter in my, in my view. My point is, of course, if we're moving towards some outcome-based uh, payment or reward uh, for care, the outcome is determined in part by the attitudes, feelings, and expectations of the consumer. If the consumer's behavior in globally uh, involves 30% of activity or expenses of unrelated, unnecessary, and questionable activity, how can we define outcome? My own view would be the idea that we're going to design a payment system based on the outcomes of individual patients is, it ain't going to happen. It's, it, there, there are some very deep fundamental reasons why it can't work, right? There's informational problems between the provider and the patient and so on and so forth that mean it can't work. Whether or not you somehow look at, again, institutions or more higher aggregates in the performance overall and somehow relate that to performance to certain kinds of rewards, not necessarily financial again. There are other ways you can reward people for good performance. That's a different question, but the idea that at some individual patient level, how much you get paid is going to depend upon outcomes, it, it, it will never work. So, <coughs> Rick, and then there's a question back here, and then I have a question for the panel. A reflection on that, that the yes. question that was raised, <coughs> though, is that I, I think there is sometimes a tipping point, and I'm not sure how or why it happens, but I'll raise the issue of cough and cold syrups for children. It's been known for 30 years that they, under five, they are completely ineffective and that they have dangers. It's been known for 30 years. There's been research, solid research on this, that there are all kinds of irrational combinations. There are cough suppressants with expectorants in them. You're supposed to cough less or you're supposed to cough more, or, or, or both, all in the same medicine. And it's only happened in the last few years that these, that those, and this is a multi-billion dollar industry, it's only happened in the last few years that this area has been regulated, that there are warning labels, that there are strong recommendations from professional societies that children under five should not be on cough suppressants, antihistamines for, for, for coughs, expectorants, all that kind of stuff, and that the decongestants particularly uh, leave some children prone to hyperactivity, seizures, and all kinds of other harms, and many of these have now actually been removed from the market. So where that tipping point came, where the evidence was 30 years old of l complete lack of benefit, not a single study showing any benefit at all, lots showing harm, took 30 years to hit a tipping point. When is it hit for vitamin E? Vitamin E has been shown to be a complete bust. It's a, a, a same with many other multivitamins. Just in the last year, lots of harm has been shown from lots and lots of vitamin supplements and mineral supplements, calcium's under question, all kinds of things. When is the tipping point where we really as a society say this stuff is useless or this stuff is harmful and make it very clear to people. Many things don't have to be removed from the market. I don't think we'll ever remove calcium from the market. But if calcium supplements cause heart disease, some at somehow at some point, which has been well demonstrated in systematic reviews incidentally, some point at some place, that tipping point is, is going to happen. And it needs to happen for 
a glucosamine and chondroitin, it needs to happen for vitamin E, it needs to happen for a whole bunch of other things that are either useless or harmful. But I, I don't know why it happened for childhood cough syrups. I, I, uh, it has happened, and I don't know how or when it would happen for the rest, but where we have good evidence, I think it needs to find its way into advocacy in the public realm. I'm just a little unsure about how those mechanisms occur. Okay. Yep, right in the back, and then Jesse. <clears throat> I'll try to keep them short. We've got uh, about 10 more minutes, 10, 15 minutes, and uh, so let's try to keep them really short. Okay, I just wanted to go back to the uh, concept of means testing that Professor Bliss brought up, and I was just wondering what the other panelists thought about the potential and the, the limits and the risks of means testing from the perspective of financing and also equity. Jeremiah? Sure. Um, I agree. I was nodding. And I agree that that's a, unquestionably the direction we're going, as he cited. I mean, it's in this budget. There's no question that it's the direction things will be going. I, I, I guess what I would say is that's a tax. We don't want to call it a tax, so we'll call it something else. And for me, the question is, why don't we just say we want to finance the system so we will raise the tax rates for people with incomes over $160,000 rather than link it to specifically a user charge, why did you, how much did you use and so forth. So I, I, I agree completely that's a direction. We're going to see more and more of that. And in my mind, it's simply a question of there's a difference, I think, between saying as a society we're going to use our tax system as, as we regularly use it and we're going to raise the taxes to finance something we, we think is valuable. In, in, your, in your example, it is a tax increase. It's a targeted tax increase for those who use the system. So it's a, it's a tax linked to use of the system rather than your income per se. And no. so that's a difference. But language is everything. Because, oh. because you say, uh, I want to raise your taxes, and people say, no way. I say, we think people who can afford it should pay a greater share of the drugs they use. And they say, well, that's not so bad. <laughs> and you could go on and I, to suggest, for example, that the, the one uh, tax, tax increase that McGinney managed to bring in that has in fact worked is the Ontario health care premium. Designated taxes are in fact the way to go in the future at a time when we have no faith in governments to spend general revenue sensibly. I agree. He, he also got hammered when he introduced that. Because all the polls said people are willing to pay more if it's just for health care. He introduced it and got hammered. Fortunately, it was a left distance before an election. And it didn't, uh, Rick, I'll, I'll, I'll bet that. you it would, goes up in the next two I, or three I, years. I don't doubt that. I think you're right. I would, I would just say that when it comes to sort of user fees, the, the issue is for, that, that people start to use the maximum amount of health care when they're old and they're sick and they have the least ability to pay. So a little bit of marginal income from those earning over 160,000, whether you call it a tax or a user fee, I don't think actually really matters so much, but people are unable at the time when they are most vulnerable, most sick, old, and facing lots of challenges. The average Ontarian, that is the time of their life course they are least able to start paying user fees. So I'm, I'm not a big fan. The other thing is I went to public health school in the US in the late 80s, and the mantra there was, a health system for the poor is a poor health system. So if we split the rich off, and the rich can buy their own services, pay their own way, do all their own stuff, there will be no pressure to reduce waiting times, there will be no pressure to improve quality, there will be no pressure from the well-educated and the wealthy to make the system work, and I think that's what's helped to make the system work. What makes an, an education system work in Ontario is the balance we have between uh, public schools and private schools, in which the private schools help to keep the public schools honest and up to standard. Jesse? <laughs> yeah, I have, I have a question based actually on the work of... Sorry. It's a question based on the work of someone here at Massey College. Carolyn Tui wrote about um, her book, Accidental Logics, talking about paths of dependency and, and windows of opportunity, and talking about how health systems evolve along certain paths and only when opportunities really arise. And we've talked a lot about culture today from at least two speakers, and I wish we could have uh, talked to Dr. Turnbull about this, but my question really is about some of the larger changes that we've talked about here. 
I really hoped that the 2014 Health Accord might have represented an opportunity for that to happen. And I was told that I was naive, and I think maybe, obviously, in retrospect, I was. So the question really is, to the, the panel, what is it going to take? What, what do you think are the elements that need to be in place for significant health policy changes to occur in this country? Do you want to, Jeremiah, do you want to try? <laughs> <laughs> I might have made to think about it. Um, you know, I, I, I think, so a couple of comments first. One is, many people thought the mid-1990s were that moment, right? And it turns out, as we said, we temporarily restrained, restrained growth and expenditures, didn't achieve a lot of really serious reform, and therefore things bounced right back afterwards. Um, will the next five years or so uh, present that opportunity? Perhaps. I mean, clearly, there is a feeling among some that in the absence of serious fiscal pressures, you will simply won't achieve any change. I mean, that, certainly there's a large school of thought that believes that's true. I, I, I guess for me, this goes back to my point about who's in charge in unitary systems, um, in the sense that um, we can have fiscal problems, but um, unless we figure out how to move the pieces a bit amongst the stakeholders, the docs, the hospitals, the government, and so forth, I, I'm not, I have to admit, I'm not hopeful. I, and and I, I wish I could give you a better answer because I've been thinking about this for a while. As to what is it in Canada that has made it so difficult for us to affect system-wide change? And, and, and it's, a, it's a dynamic at a number of levels of the system. Um, so it's an ina inadequate answer for you, but it's the best I can say right now. Michael, and then Rick. The system is changing all the time. The system has changed virtually beyond recognition from uh, the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. Think about what goes on in hospitals and doctors' offices. Um, think about those of you who are going into medicine. Think of how your practice is going to change over your lifetime. The notion that it's somehow static is... is um, Hard to, hard to get your mind around. Uh, there are all sorts of forces driving change. They may not necessarily be organizational. They certainly aren't done by planners or engineers. Nobody at the University of Toronto in the 1920s said, let's invent insulin. But it happened, and the human condition was changed. Uh, so uh, to me, that's a non-issue. Now. People get impatient because young people, of course, want to see even more change. And what's happening is we're ratcheting up our expectations so high that we, we think that, that things aren't changing. We think our system is broken. It's troubled. The fact is, by any past standard, we're the luckiest generations there ever were. I was once on a CBC panel that asked historians, when in history would you want to be alive? And the answer, instant agreement was now. And the instant reason because we're so fortunate at the way in which healthcare is enriching our lives. Never, never sell uh, the, the idea of progress short. Okay, Rick, quick, quick um, comment and yeah. then two last questions. Uh, quick, quickly, I'm, I'm hopeful that there will be some change because of the confluence of a few things. One of them is financial hard times that I think can lend itself to change. Another is that there's starting to be broad agreement about how our system needs to move. So I'll give you an example. The hospital readmission rate for congestive heart failure, chronic obstructive lung disease, and a few other conditions are more than 25% in the first 30 days. These people bounce back very rapidly to the most expensive kind of care that we can possibly provide. That hasn't changed in a decade. It's been the same. We don't have any structures to address that. The hospitals can't address it by themselves. Home care CCACs can't address it by themselves, and family doctors can't address it by themselves. And I believe we're in the process of creating structures that are local to the local setting where people will seriously dig in. This is, for example, articulated as Health Quality Ontario's number one priority for the next three, three years, avoidable hospitalizations and re-hospitalizations, number one priority, and it's a very high priority of the ministry. And although it's a diffuse system without exact actors, there will be things, in my view, that will move forward because of these intractable, intractable problems that we can no longer throw money out at 
we need more fundamental change. And I think there will be local resources and local structures that will help work through these problems. And increasingly, we have capacity to measure things and hold people accountable, particularly in the primary care sector. We've measured nothing and held no one accountable for anything. And increasingly, that is happening. And I can see it actually happening fairly rapidly that will drive change. And so I'm more hopeful. Yeah, having a huge impact on change. There's two other uh, questions. Uh, yeah, in the back. And then, yeah. And again, just try to be as brief as you can. Yeah. Uh, several of the presenters today have talked about, I guess, those the twin elements of the, the, the imperative or the need for disaggregated data analysis and and the, the need for evidence-informed policy program and decision-making. Uh, and when you think about those two and, and link it to what Jeff was saying earlier about the, the historically disadvantaged populations, the Aboriginal groups, disability groups, single parent, uh, people of color, I would add people of color to the list that he had put on his slideshow. But when you think about that, how, how in, the, in this post, um, mandatory long-form census era, how, how do we now best capture that data on a provincial basis or in other, in other institutional or systemic ways, whether it be health records, help allowing people to self-identify on various bases so that we can better track differential outcomes and disparities so that we can better target our, our programs. Michael, do you want to try that, or, or should I give it over to Rick? I could say the Ministry of Health will get, um, get its information technology right and it'll do it all for us. But I don't think I believe that. <laughs> it's already been a $1.6 billion. Anyway, go on. The uh, uh, Canadians have been allergic to the idea of collecting information about social class, race, ethnicity. We really haven't bought in. Every U.S. Uh, piece of data has got race on it. And that's how they know there's such tremendous black and Hispanic disparities, because it's collected for everything. And we, we really need a culture shift to allow ourselves to collect and understand those data. Toronto hospitals right now are, have a pilot study going of thousands of people right. who are being asked to record that information. In my setting, it's going to be on tablets going directly into their uh, tablet computers, going directly into their electronic medical records and other places like CAMH, it's on pen and paper, in Mount Sinai, in Toronto Public Health. So this is to test out the concept of whether patients attending a hospital outpatient or inpatient setting are willing to tell you what country they came from, when they arrived in Canada, how they self-identify by ethno-racial group, how they self-identify by socioeconomic status, level of income and education. I don't know the answer yet, but I suspect a lot of people will, will, will find that acceptable, not, not everyone will. We've got a lot of workarounds in secondary data that are proxies and workarounds that are not perfect, like the postal code linked to the census, but, but they, they do show you the broad contours of those disparities. So I would like much better information. A little unclear whether we're entirely ready for that, but I would hope we were. Okay. Jeremiah, very quickly. That's, and then last that's all very good, but it cannot ever replace a population-based census. Because you just collect data you. on, on I'm whoever, you. Yeah, I'm whoever you showed on up at the hospital. I'm with you. See. So, <laughs> you know, it, 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 we, we will need to rely upon more things like that, but the simple answer is there's no replacement for a census. I agree with you. Okay, last question. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so the Canada Health Act, it, it was obviously an incredible framework for its time, but uh, people have questioned... Um, just hold the mic up to you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Commentators have questioned its utility um, in the 21st century. So I'm just qu uh, curious uh, to get the panel's perspective. To what degree do you believe this legislation is enabling or debilitating for reform today? So the role of the place of the Canada Health Act in today's issue around health care. Um, it's, very, it's very tricky in... Dr. Hurley will comment. He made a very important point about the legal uh, situation. Um, and uh, the, you talked about British Columbia. And the Shaoli case in Quebec seemed to me to signal that the courts were, in effect, going to void the Canada Health Act in extreme situations. And I would also say um, we talk about the way the federal government is in effect trying to withdraw from health care and 
does that mean it's not going to enforce the Canada Health Act? Um, it's hard to know what's going on in Ottawa's mind. Uh, but I would also say that, again, the courts, the judges may be really the people in charge. And if you look at the Supreme Court of Canada's reasoning in the recent decision about um, securities regulation when it threw out federal attempts to give leadership in national security regis legislation, I think that the court may well decide that Ottawa cannot trench, cannot use the spending power anymore to try to regulate the way provinces handle health care. I think that's a real possibility. Others, do you want to comment? You don't have to, you don't. Just very quickly, I mean, just to say, reinforce, the standards of evidence for the legal case are very different than, than what we think in regular policy debates. And so, it, you know, we, you would have to be able to, to win, you'd have to show that in allowing insurance to enter the system uh, uh, would lead to real harm and therefore the, it's necessary to prohibit it in order to achieve our goals. And that's a very different standard of evidence than just, you know, we, we think there might be some effects and blah, blah, blah. It, it's very difficult to establish that. So, again, I would, I would reinforce it. There's a very, there's a non-trivial chance that, that it will be uh, thrown out uh, by, by these decisions. Um, I'll just stop there, because again, the Canada Health Act is there. It's, do you think that... So, sorry, okay, sorry, I'm just going to... My, 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 very brief, my very <clears throat> brief answer to that is an enormous proportion of foreclosures in the U.S. at the peak of the housing crisis, I think 30, 40, 50 percent, were on the basis of crushing medical and hospital bills. I don't think that's the kind of society we want to be. My so answer. I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, wrap up. Uh, thanks, Rick, Jeremiah, and uh, Michael. Um, a great panel, a little bit of friction. It's good. In fact, a lot of friction, a little fire. But where there's fire, there's light, and you can see the way forward. So uh, thanks. It was absolutely uh, fantastic.